Hello, friends, and welcome back to another podcast of Women at the Well Ministries, where we believe that all of us have to come to Jesus like the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Our highest priority is making God real in your life. Whether you are listening in our app, in your favorite podcasting app, or on our website at watwm.org, we invite you to sit down with us as we look to the scriptures to learn more about God and to strengthen your daily walk with Jesus Christ. Living a life for Christ, she's a happy girl. In this episode of the Woman at the Well Ministries podcast, join Kim Miller and Erica Close in a conversation as we walk with Jesus. In today's conversation, we find ourselves after Easter, but we are continuing a series of conversations about the week leading up to Jesus's death and his resurrection. Join us as we look at these events and their message for our lives. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Erica Close, and I'm here with Kim Miller. Hello, and thank you. What a joy it is to spend the next few moments with you just walking through Saturday of Holy Week. I'm so excited. We've we've gotten to Saturday, and we know what that means. We know what our next podcast will be about, and that is very exciting. But today we are talking about Saturday. I don't know. A lot of people refer to Saturday as the silent Saturday, but we've got a lot to say about Saturday. So, Eric, you want to get us started? Sure. So Saturday was a tremendously bleak day, right? It was a day of, we would say, silence. It was a day of stillness. And it was a day when Jesus himself was completely isolated, isolated from the Father, isolated from his followers, and and he was confined. It wasn't anything like the Friday previous, and it certainly wasn't anything like what we know to, to happen on Sunday. And, you know, it was a day when he was literally, literally dead. And while that had been seen by so many people, the enemies of Jesus were still very nervous. And they really wanted to make sure that he stayed dead and that he stayed buried. And so we're going to take a look at Matthew 27, verses 62 through 66. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way and make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So here we have a setting where the religious leaders go to Pilate on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, and they're going to make sure the tomb of Jesus has extra guards and extra protection. They want to make sure that no shenanigans takes place. And so these were the same people breaking the Sabbath by traveling and working on that day that crucified Jesus for healing on the Sabbath earlier. So you see these double standards, and you see that today among people who are looking and attacking Christians and doing the very same things themselves, not realizing that we are Christians are just simply sinners saved by grace. And so they're willing to break the Sabbath for their needs. And they're trying to do everything they can to keep the body of Jesus from being stolen. So, but what the religious leaders didn't understand was that the disciples weren't plotting to steal Jesus's body, but instead they are bewildered, depressed, they're wallowing in the silence and unanswered prayers of Saturday. Because here's the reality, Jesus is still dead. Jesus is still in the grave. And they're probably terrified that they're the next that's going to be crucified because of their association with Jesus. And so they're afraid that 
they're going to suffer the very same violence and bad end result. They're also grieving the loss of a friend and a teacher. And don't forget, they're probably very humiliated. They really believe that he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Yet he is still dead, and he is in the grave. You know, I think it's really interesting that the enemies of Jesus did what they could. They did everything that they could to prevent his resurrection, right? When we read in the scriptures, it says, now the next day, the day that followed the day of preparation. So the day of preparation was the day that was just before the Sabbath day. So, and Jewish Sabbath is Saturday, but I think it's what's amazing is that this very time in history when Christ rises from the dead is what turns to us then having the Christian Sabbath on Sunday, right? So they had their day of preparation to prepare for their Sabbath. But I think it's amazing to think that Jesus's death prepared the way for the Christian Sabbath, right? We get to celebrate on Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. And you make a really good point when you talk about how you know the chief priests and the Pharisees should have been doing the business of the Lord, which was their job on the Sabbath, but instead they were dealing with Pilate. They were doing things that they really shouldn't have been doing. And in doing so, they're really just adding to the, their rebellion, right? They're adding to the sins that they had committed. And as you said, they had that double standard, right? They'd often ridicule Jesus for working on the Sabbath, for healing people and changing their lives and doing so much good. But now they're just trying to to cause harm. And one of the things that I love so much in that passage that we read was that they understood and they had listened to what Jesus said when Jesus said that after three days, I will rise again, right? They knew what he had said, and they were going to do all that they could to make sure that that didn't happen. They were speaking to try and keep Jesus dead, and it didn't work. But we're still on Saturday. And to those who believed, it was life. Mm -hmm. But to those who were persecuting him, it was death, and they remembered it with rage and malice. So here's the scene again. They're speaking of Pilate with respect. They call him Sir. Mm -hmm. While they refer to the truth itself, which is Jesus, as a deceiver. We see that in our world today, where right is looked at as wrong, and wrong is looked like as right. And so if you look closely here, You see that they were asking the tomb to be guarded because they feared the resurrection. They knew enough to know that Jesus said it, that it could very well be true. Even Jesus' enemies, even when it looks like things are going their way, are still in fear of losing and being looked like they were wrong. There's no peace where there is no Jesus. Oh, that's good. And when you look at our lives today, that is so true. People who look like they have everything are killing themselves. They're losing everything they have. They're destroying their families. They're out looking for pleasure in a bottle, in in some sort of drug, some sort of addiction that they are choosing to try to fill this void because we were created to serve Jesus. And there's a longing in our heart that will never be satisfied by anything else. And where there is no Jesus, there is no peace. They claimed that the disciples would come and steal the body. That was simply ludicrous. What would that have even proved? Why why would they have even done it? If Jesus did not rise from the dead, as he said, he would then be something that was making them look stupid. It was the disciples that had the most to lose. Mm -hmm. So why would they come and steal it? They had left everything that this world had to offer to follow him. They really understood, Mark 8, 36, which says, For what shall a profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? They were all in. So if he doesn't rise like he says he's going to, they're the ones that look foolish. They're the ones that 
have the most to lose. And all the power of hell and earth was doing everything it could to keep Christ in the grave. But it wouldn't be enough. That was all in vain, because when his hour was come, death and those sons and heirs of death could no longer hold him, and sin and death no longer had dominion over him. To guard the sepulcher against the poor, weak disciples was folly as well as needless. It was just stupid. But to try to guard the sepulcher against the power of God was absolutely insane. It was fruitless and had no purpose. Yet they thought they were acting wisely. They really did. And again, that just reminds me of how people live their lives today, making all these decisions and they think, oh, I've got it all. And yet they're just striving to get more and they're living with no peace and they have no joy. And basically the wages of sin is death and it is constantly destroying their lives and they're acting as if they got it all. But where there is no Jesus, there is no peace. And I think it's interesting because we've spent so much time talking about the Pharisees, about Jesus's enemies. Right. They don't have they don't have Jesus and they are running around not in peace. Right. Trying to make sure that that evil prevails. And then we have to stop and think for a minute about what the disciples doing are doing. We already talked about how they were in mourning. Right. We, We have very we have no real account of what happened on that day for the disciples, but no doubt they were just, I'm sure, sitting in grief and shocked and, you know, probably in, in silence. And it's interesting because as Jesus's enemies said, and as we know, the disciples heard, he said that he would return. And while this silent Saturday is happening to them, Jesus had prepared them for this day as well. In John chapter 16, we read an account of Jesus talking to his disciples, and we believe that this conversation happened on the Thursday of Holy Week. And Jesus took the time to warn them about the grief and the disappointment and the doubt and the silence that they were going to have in the days to come. And he talks about it in in mourning and in a time of grief. So we're going to look at John 16, 20 through 22. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Jesus was letting them know that they would have a time of pain and that they would have a time of waiting and a time of grief. But he told them he was coming back. He was basically asking them to wait in faith. Mm -hmm. He was asking them to hold on to the hope that he offers them. He was asking them to believe what he said. And when we really take hold of a complete trust in Jesus Christ, and we see that this is what he's telling them in this passage, those who had walked with him and knew him, What he's saying to them is, I am your hope. You can believe and trust in me, and I will transcend your pain, your grief, and your doubt. And the hope and the trust that you have in me, the faith you place in me, will sustain you through the silence, through the grief, and through the problems. And so here's what we're learning on Silent Saturday. And it's a wonderful lesson that will take us through our troubles and our confusions and our pain that we face on a daily basis in our life. 
The disciples were confused. They were dazed. They were hurt. And they were scared during the silence. And that's just like how we are. We sometimes get that way when we don't hear from God or we don't hear what we want to hear from God. But God told them to have hope in him and to believe in him. And he would transcend their pain and their problems. He does the same thing to us. He's telling us to have hope in our time of silence and to continue to believe and trust because we know who he is. He is telling us the very same thing. And in our time of waiting, and if you'll just bring to your remembrance Psalms 4610, which says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. It's not that you're not doing anything. Being still is active. You are employing your faith at its greatest strength. You are relying totally and perfectly upon Jesus when you are still and you know. And Jesus promises that despite the silent, that joy is coming. And in our times of grief and pain, misunderstanding, confusion, betrayal, hurt, It's in those moments that we're left wallowing in the silence of God and the yet-to-be-answered prayers. We're stuck in our Saturdays, the days following our darkest moments. And this is when we can hold on to the promise, that one promise that Jesus gave his disciples some 2,000 years ago. Joy is coming, and it's a joy that no one can take away. What we learn in Silent Saturday is to trust and believe. Remember you are loved. Jesus loves you. And Sunday's coming. Thank you for joining us in today's podcast. You can visit the show notes for quotes from today's podcast and scripture references. We pray today has been a blessing, and we encourage you to reach out to us through our app, our website, or our Facebook page. You can find our app by searching for Woman at the Well Ministries in your app store or through our website at watwm.org. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash watwm. If you visit our website, you'll be able to subscribe to Bible Bits, a daily devotion written by Kim and delivered Monday through Friday by text message. Woman of the Well Ministries is a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving our Heavenly Father, and it is through your loving and generous support that our ministry continues to bless others. To learn how to partner with Woman at the Well Ministries, please visit our website. Thank you to the Gospel Group Fudge Creek for letting us use their hit song, Happy Girl. We greatly appreciate your prayers. We are praying daily for our listeners. Remember that God loves you. You are loved. to have.